Welcome to Bible Track Echoes. This program is the radio ministry of Bible Tracks Incorporated. Our mission is to take the Word of God to all the world. Our Bible teacher is the director of Bible Tracks, Pastor Mark Smith. Since 1938, Bible Tracks Incorporated has been publishing clear gospel tracks and supplying them to churches, missionaries, and individuals all over the world and all at no charge. Information on how you can receive a free sample pack of our tracks will be given at the end of this broadcast. Now for our Bible study, here is our teacher, Pastor Mark Smith. How do you do, my friend? Welcome to Bible Tract Echoes. Thanks so much for joining us. If you are listening to this program on its set schedule, then it is the Monday right after Easter. I hope that Easter Sunday at your local church and in your own heart was a great, great celebration day. Well, friend, right now my Bible sits open to Psalm 97. Psalm 97. If it's possible, reach over, open your own copy of God's Word, or turn on that gadget of yours and Join me there, Psalm 97. We're in the midst of a study of this psalm, a coronation psalm. While you're getting your Bible, also get something on which you can jot some notes. I've got three words beginning with the letter A for you today. But also with that pen and paper handy, you'll be prepared to jot down our contact information. Friend, this ministry, as my announcer said, this ministry of Bible Tract Echoes is the radio arm of a larger ministry. Our main thrust Trust of ministry is sending out gospel tracts, and that word tracts is spelled T-R-A-C-T-S. We send out gospel tracts all over the world free of charge. As a matter of fact, our mission statement says this, taking the word of God to all the world 80 years and counting for 80 years. This is our 80th year that God has enabled us to send out gospel tracts free of charge. We even pay the shipping. I want to talk about one of those tracks here in just a minute, but let me lead into the Bible study this way. How would you go about trying to explain the extent of God's power? Now, we all know that God's powerful, amen? He has all power. He is the Almighty One, but those are rather abstract terms and ideas, Well, one day, a three-year-old girl named Kelsey saw the sky growing dark and the sun was hidden, and then, as only lightning can do, there was a flash of very brilliant lightning, and the accompanying thunder was close at hand, and Kelly's house shuddered with the thunder. The three-year-old was obviously scared while her daddy wisely took her in his lap and reassured her that God knows all about thunderstorms. That dad used the moment to teach his three-year-old about just how powerful God is. He used the very tangible display of power to teach a rather intangible idea. Well, friend, God does the same thing here in Psalm 97, but you and I are not three-year-olds. So what are you and I to do as adult believers with this whole idea that God is a God of great power? Get your Bible and join me, please. The gospel tract I have here in my hand, and by the way, a gospel tract is, again, simply a short written presentation of God's plan of salvation. It's a gospel tool. It's a means by we can Uh, extend our personal witnessing to many more people than we have the ability to verbally tell the gospel. Well, a gospel tract in my hand right now was entitled, A Would-Be Suicide. A Would-Be Suicide. This gospel tract is a true story about a man named Luther, Luther Cook, who was a professional musician, but his life was a mess He was ready to commit suicide. He had the note written. He had his gun in hand. He was in a restaurant eating a final meal before he planned to kill himself. But then across the restaurant at a different table, a 16-year-old girl bowed her head and prayed. That shuddered his soul, just like that three-year-old's house was shuddered. It shook his soul. He went over and talked with her. And that day, Luther Cook's life was turned around. He did not commit suicide. He became a powerful servant of the gospel. Friend, this is a good track. It may not be the right track for everybody, but trust me, in our society, this is a good track. This is just one that's in a sample packet of tracks I want to put into your hands. Would you let me do that, please? 
Be ready when my announcer gives our contact information. Give us your name and address. We'll send you that sample packet free of charge. You can just go to our website, which is BibleTracksInc.org. If your Bible's open there, the Psalm 97, beginning at verse 1, says this, The Lord reigneth, let all the earth rejoice, let the multitude of the isles be glad thereof, clouds and darkness are round about him, righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne, a fire goeth before him and burneth up his enemies round about, his lightnings enlightened the world, the earth saw and trembled, go down to verse 8 and 9, Zion heard and was glad, and the daughters of Judah rejoiced because of thy judgments, O Lord, for thou, Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. Please stop right there. Now, my three-part outline for Psalm 97 goes like this. Verses 1 through 7, I've titled, Let All the Earth Be Glad. These two verses, verses 8 and 9, I've titled, Let All Israel Be Glad. And the final three verses here, 10 through 12, Let All the Righteous Be Glad. Now, Psalm 97 is about the present reign of God from his heavenly throne in verses 1 and 2, but this psalm quickly moves to talk about his future earthly reign from Jerusalem's throne. All people who believe God's word believe in the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what's being described here at his second coming as described like in Matthew 24 and 25. Jesus will come in all of his power, in all of his glory. Three times in this psalm, the word glad or gladness is used. You'll find it in verse 1, verse 8, and verse 11. When Jesus comes, gladness will be the order of the day. Well, it'll be the order of the day once those who have rejected him are destroyed. That's what Revelation 19 says will happen. Then great gladness will be the order of the day for 1,000 years. Then then after that 1,000 years, Jesus' reign will merge into what's called the eternal state, and all believers will be in utter gladness forever and forever and forever, for thus we shall forever be with the Lord. But I mentioned three words beginning with the letter A. Let me deal with them based upon our passage here. Number one is this ashamed. There are some ashamed people. And there in verse 7, I need to reach back one verse. I want to pick this up here. God made people to have a body, soul, and spirit. That much you know. Because we're made that way, we are spiritual beings. We are designed to worship someone or something. Those who do not worship Jesus do worship something. When Christ comes, those people will be ashamed. That's what the word confused or confounded means there in verse 7. But my second word, beginning with the letter A, is the word accepting. Verse 8 says there are some accepting verses. Verse 8 focuses on the Jews. When verse 8 uses the word Zion and talks about the people of Judah and so on, it's a reference, obviously, to Jerusalem and the Jews who call that city their capital. God gave Jerusalem to them. When you read the Gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're going to see Jesus' first coming. And as you read them, you're amazed at at least two basic things. Basic thing number one is the open display by Jesus of his Messiahship. But then number two, the open rejection of Jesus as Messiah by the vast majority of the Jews. Friend, Jesus healed hundreds and probably even thousands of people during his earthly ministry. But yet, in spite of that, the Jews as a whole rejected him. Jesus came unto his own, but his own received him not. But at his second coming, at his victory at the Battle of Armageddon, as Revelation 19 describes, Jesus will then judge the living earth dwellers. I'm going to throw a few Bible passages and Bible statements at you here right now, five of them in all. Are you ready? Jot them down. Number one, based upon Isaiah chapter 11 and chapter 27, Jesus will gather the Jews together again at the place called the promised land. Number two, 
based upon Ezekiel chapters 20 and then Malachi chapter 3. At that time, Jesus will judge all Israel. Number three, based upon the book of Joel chapter 2, At that time, the repentant Jews who have received Jesus in the tribulation period will receive the blessing of the new covenant that we read about in Jeremiah 31. Then the fourth passage is Isaiah chapters 10 and 11. There we find that these believing Jews will be restored to their promised land as God gave them promise. And last one, Ezekiel's chapter 11 and 20, the unbelieving Jews who followed the beast in the tribulation period are destroyed. I realize that that was a lot of information coming at you in a very short period of of time there. If you did not get it all, you can go to our website and you can re-listen to the program and get all of that. I hope you'll do that. But notice right now, verse 9 of Psalm 97, my third word beginning with the letter A. The third word is the word ascended. Verse 9 talks about the ascended person. I love the present tense verbs of verse 9. Verse 9 says, For thou, Lord, art, not will be, but art, present tense, high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. Tell me something, friend. Is that how you see Jesus today? Do, do you have a, that fact of him being at the right hand of the Father as a settled, joy-giving truth in your soul? Is it there? Or perhaps it's merely something that, well, you give mental assent to, you say you believe it, but that fact has no real effect on your day-to-day earth-bound walk the theology we learn about in the Word of God, the theology that hopefully your Bible-preaching pastor teaches from the pulpit and in the Sunday school classes at your local church, those facts there are not just things for you and I to get a good grade on some theology test. They're to help us walk through life. Oh, beloved, you and I live in a sin-harboring, sin-hurting world. And as we walk through it today, we are going to struggle with our earthly eyes to see Christ enthroned. But the lost people around us, those that we meet, they're in desperate need to meet a child of God with the truth that Jesus is ascended on high and is giving peace to those that belong to him. Peace in the midst of all this muck and yuck. Oh, those are not good theological terms, but they sure describe the present world we live in. It's muck and yuck. You know why? Because we sinned against the holy God, and he's letting us enjoy the fruit of our wickedness. But there is a rescue. The rescue from this wickedness is in the person of Jesus Christ. Friend, you need Christ as your Savior. God loves you. God loves you to the extent he sent his only begotten Son the sinless one, to die in your place, to bear the sin debt that you owed to a holy God. He died in your place that you, through him, might be saved. You may need to surrender your heart. You need to receive him today as your Lord and Savior. Thank you for joining us today for Bible Track Echoes. If you would like to receive a free sample packet of our tracks, you can contact us by calling 309 828-6888. Our mailing address is Bible Tracks, P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. Again, our phone number is 309-828-6888. And our mailing address is P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. You can also contact us through our website, Our web address is BibleTracksInc.org. Remember, the word tracks is spelled T-R-A-C-T-S. That address is BibleTracksInc.org. May the Lord richly bless you as you serve Him.